I frequently know where I'm starting, but I don't always <laughs> have that either. And I'll be talking about different ways that I start paintings. But I do work in that way, and it's very challenging. I work sequentially, which means I have a lot of pieces going at once, and I'll work them along, and then something I can't figure out where to go next. Remember, I don't have, I'm not doing a barn and a horse outside. And I'm not working from a photograph, I'm working from my subconscious. I'm not saying that everybody should do that. I'm very much attuned to representational work. I did that for uh, quite a while. But I put that to rest. I think I had a show, my swan song to representational work in 1996 at the Chester County Art Association. I showed all representational work. And I knew I was going to, that I wasn't going to do it anymore. But I like doing it because drawing is pretty essential to hard work. Uh, so it, it helped me in my drawing, because there is a lot of drawing even in non-representational abstract work. So how did I get to where I got <laughs> to, to do this? Because as a kid, we didn't do art. Nobody in my crowd did art. We played ball. That's what we did. Maybe studied some musical instruments ineffectively. <laughs> did not do art. One of my friends became an artist. So I was working pretty hard early in my career, and Libby, that's Libby. Hey. I think most everyone knows her here, but in any case you know, uh, she signed me up for a class to study clay with my son. It was for fathers and children. And it was so fantastic because and I was working. I was working you know, all day Saturday with those days, and, she said, and it was Saturday afternoons. I said, "I can't do." She says, "Well, you'll stop working Saturday afternoons." I said, "Oh, okay. <laughs> sounds good to me." So I did that, and I really fell in love with clay. So it was so great to have it that we had two teachers, and they were fabulous teachers. I always say, if you're just lucky enough to get really good teachers early on in the study of anything. It sets you on the right path. And if you get bad teachers to start with, and say, like, I hate this, I don't want to do this, so I'll try something else. So anyhow, I, I did clay for about 12 years. And I started to have some success, mostly in the area of Judaic ritual objects. And I actually became very famous in making mezuzahs. So for those who don't know what a mezuzah is a, has a prayer inside of it and it goes on the entrance to a room uh, of a Jewish household in the doorway. It so happens my name is Safer. My ancestors were writers of mezuzahs and tovers. They did the scroll. Now, I never did the scroll. I would, that was not my thing. Can't even read his writing. I was going to say that, but they did. Thanks for mentioning it. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. So anyhow, I had the great success doing that. And every summer we would go off studying art, like some of the people are going to be taking that workshop that we're starting on Sunday for four days here. And we would go away and study. I was signed up to study clay at Parsons School of Design one in the summer. And, the, and they kept calling, every week they're calling me and saying, well, a couple of people dropped out, more dropped out. Now it's down to you and one other person. And we're not sure about the other person. But they said, you're welcome to come up here and work. I said, you know, I can stay home and work for a week by myself. <laughs> the teacher's not coming right? for two people. I said, I understand. So anyhow, we always were looking to do this in the summertime. And I, uh, I looked around and I found a place where Libby could do her textile stuff studies. And I saw oh, that I could take one week of clay. And the first week I saw there was an abstract painting. This is 1985. That same year I had a solo show at the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. And the living had one also simultaneously. So, and, and my, uh, there was a big picture of my uh, ceramic sculpture in the Philadelphia Inquirer every Sunday for three months. It's very hot, strongly embedded in a lot of Philadelphians that I do clay, even though I haven't done it since 1985. <laughs> because I fell in love with 
abstract thing. I had a, again, I was very fortunate. I had a very good teacher. And uh, I, it just hit me. And I only, only took this to mess around. I thought, well, I'll do it. I'll just sort of mess around with this. Maybe it'll help my glazing. Lo and behold, I just was crazy for it. I remember the teacher said to me, you are really wired. I said, I can't sleep. I'm thinking about this 24 hours a day. I'm making drawings. I'm doing everything. And I loved it. And I never really went back to doing clay. In fact, I, we still have my huge kill, which I'm about to either sell or give away or something. Every time we say, well, we might use it. But it's been a lot of years we haven't used it. So anyhow, I started doing this uh, abstract painting as having studied with her, and then uh, I took some a few other abstract painting classes. But then I started developing my own way of working very quickly, and I started doing work about ancient healing and medicine and ancient dentistry, uh, and and I did that for quite a long time. There's a kind of a theme to the way I work. There seems like every three or four years I'll have a thing that I'll be working on. So I, I did I stopped working on the Judaic thing. I became very disenchanted with the politicking of the synagogue I was in and all kinds of muddy stuff. And I gave that up. Uh, to, uh, and, but the next thing that came to my mind was to do work about ancient healing. Come on in. You're not too late. Thanks for coming. So you didn't miss too much. I'm just taking people through the uh, the development of my uh, my career in the in the world of art. You want to call it a career in the world of art. I met you in Northshire yesterday. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> in, in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Great. It's the center of the universe. Be. Yeah. Bookstore and they have good food too. So um, I was doing this uh, work when I had applied to a show at the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art, which is a pretty major uh, venue down in the Philadelphia area. And this woman came over. I, I had sent. Oh, I, I was working full time and doing art half time whenever I could. And I got the uh, I got the, pit, the photographs in for the jury show too late. But she looked at it, the curator, and said, "God, I really like this work." She said, "Called me up. She says, can I come over and look at your studio?" Little did she know, at this time I had stopped doing that kind of work. I was doing these giant constructions. I was building shrines and uh, I mean, uh, big stuff. Uh, which I stopped doing because no place to put it. <laughs> but I started doing that, and it was a lot of fun. And I had friends who taught me how to work with tool, you know, power tools, and do stuff. And a couple of my very dear friends are great at that, and helped me. Uh, Dan Anderson yeah. helped me invent different ways of doing things, which I didn't know anything about. But he helped me, and Joel, you know, helped me with stuff. So anyhow, they, they uh, helped Libby and me become slightly uh, decent at power tools and building things. And uh, but I, I did that, and I, I loved doing that. And I was uh, basing a lot of this stuff on uh, studying ancient, uh, ancient texts, and, and it just was uh, fascinating. And then I was kind of interpreting it into the way it might have been. Because uh, a lot of anthropology is based on speculation, from the best I can tell. There's not always proof. There's just speculation. So I figured I can speculate with the best of them. You know? <laughs> Why not? So I started speculating on how things might have been. Okay, so that period of time went on for a while, and uh, I, I started to uh, have other interests as time went on. And I realized I needed maybe a little more, a little more uh, understanding about painting. I was sort of painting, kind of from the seat of my pants. So I think your father Fred, that's what he believes in. Uh, and, and you can do a lot on your own. You can do a lot, but you can also get there faster. I think if you study with people that actually know something, 
and, uh, and you can speed the process along. So I, I started doing that, and uh, in 1998, we were walking through the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and I saw a painting by David Sequeiros, a very famous Mexican artist. And it was the most remarkable painting I had ever seen, in person at least. It, it had depth and, and that, like I never saw before, and it had a kind of transparency and translucency in areas. And it said, you know, it was oil and encaustic. And I did what everyone else does when I tell them I work in encaustic. What the hell is encaustic? <laughs> you know? uh, encaustic is hot wax with pigments in it. Oh. It started a couple thousand years ago by the Greeks yeah, and the wax. Egyptians. Is it beeswax? Oh. It's beeswax primarily. Now over the years, people have you know, figured out ways to make the beeswax much harder, stronger, and so forth. Anyhow, the, uh, those ancients, uh, those pieces are still around. Beeswax is still the most durable substance that's used in the art world. However, it's also one of the most toxic ways of working that there is. Mm. And many of them died. Many of those artists died early. And so it lost, uh, it's, people lost interest in it. As you can imagine, dying is definitely not a good thing. Mm -hmm. You would agree with that, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's not worth it. So eventually we started figuring out how to make it work. We needed ventilation. That was the big key. You need ventilation. And the powdered pigments are dangerous as it all get out. Even pastel pastels, you shouldn't work with them in, a, in an enclosed room. This is very bad. And a lot of people just don't, they just, right. artists don't think about their health. It's just amazing how they are. Uh, but anyhow, people figured it out. And a few artists became very famous for their work with this. Does anyone know who the most famous encaustic artist is in the world, maybe? Mm -hmm. It's an American artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jasper Johns, he works yeah. with encaustic. Oh. A lot of people don't even know that. That's his primary medium. And, uh, and so I, I, I saw this painting. I've tried to figure out what to do with it, and I couldn't quite figure out what to do with it. And uh, Libby had a uh, fellowship but he's an artist also. She had a fellowship. Uh, I should say I'm an artist also. Right. So when I say she's an artist also. <laughs> I, uh, she had a fellowship in uh, Sarasota at the Raymond School of Design, in printmaking. And I was supposed to have a show down there that year. Fell gallery just fell apart. It was that. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, there was a course at Raymond in Encaustic. Oh, great. So I took a course in encaustic and fell in love with that. It was, uh, it's, it just hit me perfectly because with encaustic you're doing a lot of digging and scraping and scratching. And it's very physical. It reminded me, it had a little bit of the attributes that I liked about clay, which is you could really get in there and feel it. <laughs> it had some depth of it. So the encaustic has this, uh, there's a physicality of that. <clears throat> At the same time, it was also painterly. Not as painterly as acrylic or oil, because it didn't flow like they did, or watercolor. And over a period of time, I just became crazy about it. I started teaching it around, around Philadelphia in different art centers, and then eventually around the country and the Southwest. Jersey, New York, different places. And um, I still love it. I still work with that primarily. But I also love to work with acrylic. And we'll be teaching acrylic to, uh, in the uh, workshop that we're doing. Let me just uh, talk about a few of the paintings that are here, which may help you understand how I got to where I got. A lot of people say, well, what were you trying to say in different things? Some of the times I'm not. What you'll say. Let me just do one more. I'll do this one here, for instance. Because this one, probably more than any painting here, came from a specific <coughs> way of working. And that was we had been in Thailand 
we uh, up, we're heading up north to uh, Chiang Mai. Yeah, Chiang Mai, in China. And they, they stopped for us to see this uh, garden. It was a very famous garden. Hillary Clinton and Chelsea had just been there the week before. That was its claim to fame. And it was the it was just such a profusion of color, and I kind of took a mental picture of it, and some physical pictures too. But I don't, I almost never work from any uh, photographs uh, in, a, in any direct way. And this was just a very gestural painting based on this Thai garden that we visited, and it always stuck in my mind, and it's still very, uh, it's still, I can, only, I can just remember approaching this place and going like, Oh my God! And we have Longwood Gardens where we live, which is gorgeous. But it doesn't have this place. Everything was just condensed. It was just unbelievable amount of color just booming all over the place. So, in contrast to that, above your head is this piece called Violet Stream, which is based. The concept in that is strictly abstract expressionism. In other words, I had no idea where I was going with this. I didn't start with any preconceived notion. I was just trying to let my mind play. And so now sometimes I will have a color scheme in mind. That almost always, I shouldn't say sometimes, almost always I'll have a color scheme in mind. Now I may change it as I go along, but I start with that in my head. That there's a, like here I'm working say with yellows and violet. Um, that's sort of the color scheme that I'm working with. Uh, and if it ends up that way, great. Um, this also is done kind of in that same abstract expressions way. Uh, just kind of going with tapping in things that are embedded in my mind. I don't even know from where. There are also, occasionally I work from landscape. I was taking a walk with uh, my friend Bill Gold today, and we passed something along the way. It was a gorgeous mushroom, very white. It was almost like ivory, sitting on a on this green moss, and the and the uh, tree trunk and the trunk told me it was black almost. I said, "Wow, I don't have my camera, but I still have that embedded. I took a mental picture of it." So. When will that come out? God only knows when it will. But I'm just recording these mental pictures, and uh, so there is some land, you know, some landscape uh, stuff will come out from that. Uh, this is also this was from a series. A, 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 I did a whole series of columnar. I call them columnar pieces, based on something that I learned many, many, many years ago in college, in histology laboratory, we would, we would look at something called columnar epithelium, which is a kind of a skin. <laughs> I just list that more. <laughs> but it, um, you know, it, it just stuck in my mind, you know, that, 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 and, it, and it came out. But based on, on the, just looking at some slides as a college kid. Uh, in the other room, I don't know, I know if you guys want to, you want to stand up and take yeah. a walk around a little bit? Well, and, 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 and